the matter is going to be heard by the family court, and the family court will take a decision in relation to them time spent with. So how often um, the child is taken back to wherever the father lives for holidays, and what are the, the conditions and, and the details. So once this is ordered by the family court, um, say that the other country for convenience, the other contracting country is France or Poland, um, the, because France and Poland are um, contracting states, the decision of the family court of Australia is automatically, by operation of law, recognized in those countries. There's nothing to do. So sometimes it's just even enough to show the other party in the other country, look, that's the decision, that's the convention, it's recognized. And very often there will be enough for the, the other side to comply with the decision. If not, then well, the decision has to be enforced and through a system of central authorities, um, enforcement under the convention in the other country is also very simple. Um, the second case um, I wanted to mention under this convention is derived from my practice and um, it relates to the child's property and I thought that was uh, particularly interesting because of the sort of examples that you can only see in practice and couldn't imagine in theory. So um, in that case a child lived in Australia and his great aunt um, lived and died in France and in her will she gifted this child a fifth of a house located in France. Um, then I received news from the French notary, which under the French system is the only person who can administer an estate and um, sell a house. And um, <coughs> in France, what the notary would normally do, uh, before selling the house on behalf of a child, um, what you have to do under French law is to um, obtain an order, a specific order from a judge was looking after the interest of the child, even even though the parents have um, parental responsibility. Um, so the notary contacts me and wanted to know more about what what the law was in Australia in relation to making sure, ensuring that the interest of the child in relation to real estate were protected. And um, he didn't mention it, but I, I think, and this was fair enough, that he might have been worried about his professional liability also, knowing that he couldn't obtain that order from the French court. Um, so the solution, thanks to the convention, is the following. Um, is that the mother of the child who is residing in Australia can file proceedings in the family court seeking to be appointed as a guardian of the child in relation to this property and any dealings with the succession and the estate in France. Um, the decision of the family court qualifies as a protection measure as stipulated um, by the convention and widely defined in Article 3. So the appointment of a, the mother as a guardian in Australia is automatically recognized in France by operation of law. And so thanks to this mechanism, the notary was aware of what protection mechanism we had in Australia and thanks to the automatic recognition in France, um, his responsibility was presumably protected as well. And the last convention I wanted to um, address this morning is the Convention of 1961 on the Conflicts of Laws Relating to the Form of Testamentary Dispositions. Um, <coughs> as you would guess, uh, every country has a different legislation as to the formal requirement in relation to wills. And so the convention very simply and effectively provides five grounds for the recognition of the validity of testamentary dispositions uh, made in a, in a foreign country. And it's very simple. Um, the will has to comply with one of the five grounds set out by the convention. And those are um, if the form of the will complies with the internal law of the place uh, where the testator made the will, if it complies um, with the law of the nationality possessed by the testator, either at the time he made the disposition or at the time of death, or of a place which um, the testator had his domicile, either at the time he made the disposition or at the time of his death, so it is very broad, or of the place in which the testator had his habitual residence, at the time the will was made or at the time of death, and um, in relation to immovables, um, the place where they are situated. 
So the legislation implementing the Convention in New South Wales is Section 48 of the Succession Act, Act 2006. So you will find, find these five grounds and I think a few extra under Section 48 of the Succession Act. And today, this convention has 42 contracting states, so in, in practice it, it comes in um, quite handy as well. So another case study that is also derived from my practice um, in relation to this convention, um, I'm not too sure exactly where it's going because it's ongoing, but um, without disclosing any advice, uh, I can give you the broad facts and where this is uh, going um, under the convention. And, and Section 48 of the Act, which is very straightforward. Um, the deceased dies in a civil jurisdiction where the formality relating to the validity of a will are much less um, specific than in New South Wales. That means that a handwritten will with no witnesses executing the will is still valid. So this is what we're starting with in terms of our foreign will. Um, now the will deals with properties overseas and also in Australia, in a real estate. Um, when the deceased dies in a civil jurisdiction where uh, the concept of grant of probate doesn't exist because they're not going through courts but they're going through uh, a public notary, um, obtaining the reseal of a probate might be difficult. Something I haven't dealt with um, yet, and I'm looking forward to it, but I'm sure it's going to be very interesting to try and explain to the court what the equivalent is and whether that will satisfy the court. So here we are with a will that is handwritten, um, no witnesses executing it, and um, what someone would like in Australia is a grant of probate um, in relation to the real estate locating in Australia. Um, so what happens thanks to the convention is that the testator has complied, complied uh, with the domestic law relevant to the testamentary disposition of the place he or she made the will. So, thanks to the operation of the convention, um, the will is recognized as valid as to its form in Australia, even though the will didn't respect the requirement as to form um, of the New South Wales legislation. So, now this is becoming theoretical, but I'm very good hopes that thanks to the operation of the convention, it shouldn't be an issue to obtain probate in Australia, and I'm not talking the receipt of a grant of probate, which never existed in the other jurisdictions to start with, but since we're starting with a will that is valid in Australia in terms of its form, obtaining probate in Australia should be easier. And the consequence of that is that this will enable the executor to administer the estate and any eligible person in New South Wales um, to file a family provision in relation to the real estate located in, in New South Wales. Um, so many aspects of family life are covered as you saw um, by the conventions I, I touched upon today and um, as uh, explained by Christoph already, additional family matters such as adoption, child support, spousal maintenance, and the protection of adults are addressed by other head conventions. Uh, from an Australian perspective, um, as uh, mentioned by Ian Coleman, I see, um, there is a major area which is not covered um, in Australia, is the question of spousal property in the context of international divorces, um, whether in presence of prenuptial agreements, as they are called worldwide, or not. And um, there are two reasons for this vacuum. Uh, first, Australia is not a party to the Hague Convention of 1978 on the law applicable to matrimonial property regimes. So that's in instances where you don't have a uh, prenuptial agreement or financial agreement, as we say in Australia. And second, um, there is no Hague Convention addressing the issue of the recognition <coughs> and enforcement of a uh, foreign um, prenuptial or antenuptial financial agreements. So that's the major area in terms of family law that we need to be covered in the future. Thank you very much. I actually own a factory of pens. <laughs> I'll get a tell him every time.
Well, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, top marks to you, and uh, to be fair to uh, David as well, top marks to David for his contribution. And thank you very much on behalf of uh, myself and Rick uh, for your contribution today as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Chantal Bainey. I'm here from Victory Lawyers. I'd just like to introduce our next speaker, Nicola Nye. She's actually daughters of, daughter of Peter Nye, who was um, mentioned by Christoph Panofsky earlier. Um, so she's actually the one who organises the scholarships for students to go over and do internships in the heart, which is really interesting if anyone's interested in speaking to her about that. Um, so she, for, for over 20 years, she worked with Allens as a litigation solicitor before moving on to um, the boutique firm of Revolution, uh, what is it? Revolution Litigation Lawyers in Sydney, where she acts as special counsel in, um, in commercial law with special interest in international law. Um, so it's my honour to introduce Nicola to speak to us briefly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chantal. Um, I wanted to say at the outset what a wonderful initiative this seminar is, and I particularly wanted to um, commend um, Shakane Musulman and Rick Mitri, Mitri for organising this. It's fantastic to see an initiative like that, this that raises awareness of the work of the Hague Conference. Um, my father did many things during his lifetime, but he had a continuing involvement with the Hague Conference from the time that Australia sent its first delegation in the 1970s um, until when my father was a um, co-rapporteur on the Judgments Project at the time of his death in 2002. He um, was, as Christoph said at his um, funeral, a great um, friend of the Hague Conference and he considered his work for the Hague Conference to be the greatest of, most important of all the work that he did during his life. So it seemed appropriate to us to set up this internship award um, in his memory, which we did in 2006. <coughs> and the award was set up with substantial donations by members of my family and also from the Attorney, Commonwealth Attorney General's Department, which um, reflected both the, um, the importance that the federal government places on the work of the Hague Conference and the respect that the Attorney General had for my father's work. We set up the award in conjunction with the Australian Institute of International Affairs, which is a think tank that looks at international policy, um, and the International Law Association, Australian branch, of which my father had been the president and was at the time of his death the immediate past president. So these were two associations that my father had a very close connection with and it's been a fantastic experience over the last 10 years, <coughs> 11 years now, working with them. Um, the International Australian Institute in particular has the benefit of tax deductibility for donations to the internship award um, and has a program of interns who um, from both within Australia and overseas, who've helped us a lot with publicity for the award. So what we look for in an intern is um, where um, it's a program where we provide a, um, a, a relatively modest payment to assist an intern um, to go to do an unpaid internship at the Hague Conference for up to six months we make a contribution that covers airfares, travel expenses, and a contribution towards living expenses for that period. Um, the intern must be under the age of 35, a graduate um, of a primary law degree from an Australian law school, that is an LLB or a JD, or um, a postgraduate student at an Australian law school. And 
We, today is an apt time to talk about the internship program because we are now, um, today is the closing date for applications for the 2017 internship program. So, a bit late to get your applications in, but um, we, we've had some fabulous interns. Um, and I think what, what we look for in particular in an intern is somebody with a genuine demonstrated interest in private international law and the areas of um, specific interest to the Hague Conference. Um, this does narrow the field somewhat. We get a lot of applications from people who would like to be an uh, international criminal lawyer and this is not what that's about. This is about working with the conventions that you've, you've heard about today. Um, and we also look for somebody who has a global outlook. We're often looking for people who are very, very strong linguists, uh, but people who are able to work in an environment where, as, as David mentioned earlier, you're working with people who come from very, very different legal backgrounds, very different ways of thinking about the law. And so you need a certain level of mental agility and outlook that sees yourself as a global citizen. Um, We've now, we're about to send our 12th intern to the Hague Conference and they have worked in all areas of the um, work of the Hague Conference. Usually a highlight for our interns is to participate in an international diplomatic conference. Um, most, the most recent intern, um, Reina um, G, um, participated in the first special commission for the um, judgments, draft judgments convention and then worked on preparatory work for the Apostoli Convention that's going to be in November of this year. They also um, are involved in the ongoing work of the Permanent Bureau, um, researching um, how countries and surveying countries about how they are, um, how the um, conventions work for them, <coughs> what can be done to improve the conventions and to assist countries with inquiries um, that they have about compliance. Um, and they do research on um, future conventions as well. So it, it really is a, a very broad exposure to, um, to the work of the Hague Conference that they get. And I think they've, I hope they've made a great contribution to the work of the Hague Conference that is one of the objectives of the program is to support the ongoing work of the Hague Conference and also to create ambassadors for the Hague Conference who come back to Australia um, and promote the work of the Hague Conference and have a, um, a global outlook to, um, to the practice of law here. If anybody has any questions about the um, internship program, they're very welcome to speak to me about it. Um, I have with me a copy, some copies of the report of our last intern, um, which I'm happy to share with people and um, happy to answer any questions if you want to come and speak to me later. Thank you very much. My name is Farnas Megami. Um, I'm a law student and also a paralegal at Metro Lawyers. Um, I'm honoured today to introduce Professor Suzanne Howard. She's a lecturer at the University of Canberra, an adjunct fellow at the University of Western Sydney, and also a member of the International Lawyers of the Australian Capital Territory Law Society. Now please help me in welcoming Suzanne to the stage to speak to us briefly. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by um, thanking you all for this brief opportunity to speak and to indicate that uh, I'm very grateful for the work of Nicola's father because I too am one of the students who learned complex of law on, with the benefit of his textbook. Now, unlike uh, Judge Coleman, who had the privilege of working with the late Professor and I, I simply benefited from the learning of his text. And in my current work at the University of Canberra, 
I'm teaching a small business advice clinic, which is a pro bono service, uh, uh, which is conducted out of ACT Legal Aid every Thursday afternoon. And without fail, I can tell you that every week I have uh, a need to draw on my learnings of choice of law that I uh, learned from Professor Nye as a student. So, uh, as Sandrine mentioned in her presentation, these are not the sorts of questions which are but uh, textbook academic exercises. They're real law issues which are occurring in people's lives and which make a significant difference to the quality of their lives. It's wonderful that um, the Secretary General of the Hague Conference is able to visit us at this time because uh, there is an enormous opportunity for Australian leadership in this area of law at this time, for it is with a dialogue of conflicts of law and an understanding of these issues that you're able to navigate um, cross-border issues and work in an interdisciplinary space. Um, I'll make one final remark about uh, some work that I have been involved in with a number of other Australian legal professionals uh, with the work of UNSTRAL, which is the uh, part of the UN that develops UNED um, model trade laws. And like the work of the Hague Conference, these things take many, many years to develop. And in that space, we've um, developed an association called Friends of UNSATRAL in Australia, and that's being used as a vehicle to draw together um, the many members of the Australian profession, be they in the judiciary, those working in government, as well as in the public and private sector, to support the work of UNSATRAL. And it, it's wonderful that the Nye family has established the internship to support the amazing disciplines, disciplinary work of, of her father. But perhaps it's also time for the Australian legal community to think about the establishment of, a, of a, an association, a loose association of Australian friends to support um, the work of the Hague Conference at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne. What a wonderful array of speakers. Would you please join me in thanking them once more? Uh, Dr. Bernasconi and the uh, speakers have, uh, and Justice McDougall has to get away soon, but uh, have kindly agreed to take part in a panel of question and answer and, and, uh, uh, and uh, a, a discussion panel. Uh, could I kindly ask all the speakers to take a chair on the stage? throughout the uh, seminar. There's no point that's been niggling at me because apart from my own contribution, I found it a fascinating morning. Uh, one thing that Christoph mentioned was international cooperation and at least at a regional level, the courts in the Asia Pacific region are starting to develop models of cooperation, uh, particularly in the commercial area. Uh, the Supreme Court of New South Wales, the Supreme Court of the other states, courts of the other states, and the Federal Court are forging regional links with the courts of Singapore, Hong Kong, and other Asia Pacific regions with a view to enabling us as judges of the particular court to assist our colleagues in the other courts to understand aspects of Australian law that may come up, to find out from them how to deal with aspects of the laws of their country that may come up, and to try and regularise practice across the jurisdictions so that uh, litigants have more certainty and more familiarity with what's going on. And in fact, after I returned from the two weeks leave, which I started about four and a half hours' time, I hope, uh, I'm going to Hong Kong to speak at a meeting of regional commercial judges pursuing that very aim. And it's a, an example, I think, of a, a less formal, I won't say informal initiative, that is pursuing one of the aims that Christoph mentioned. Thank you, Judge. 
Is there any questions? Uh, or anybody, sorry? Uh, yes, no, Rick, if I may just follow up on this, uh, because <laughs> I remember about 19 years ago when I joined the conference, or the, the Hague conference, one of the first major tasks I was asked to accomplish was to organize the first international center ever organized by the Hague conference. And that was a, a really fascinating exercise also because it led to the establishment of what is nowadays called the International Hague Network of Judges. And uh, it is through, these, uh, through this network composed of family law uh, judges uh, in particular um, that we can also facilitate the effective operation of the child abduction and other uh, child protection uh, conventions. And this gives me the opportunity to share with you what I think are very encouraging uh, developments in the in the wider region uh, here. Um, today is the very day where in Pakistan the Council of Ministers is discussing the possibility for Pakistan to join the Child Abduction Convention. So needless to say that we are uh, eager to know the outcome of, uh, of this discussion. And uh, similar, very positive uh, developments we hear in India, where the Chief Justice of India has just uh, two weeks ago agreed to designate two Indian judges to this network, the hate network of judges that I was just uh, referring to, which can also be seen as a uh, prelude, as it were, uh, for India to join uh, the uh, Child Abduction uh, Convention, which uh, again would be an absolutely uh, major Thank you, Doctor. Anyone else from the panel want to make a statement or make a point? What about from the audience? Anyone like to make a Yes, John. <coughs> um, thank you. I'm Rifat Debay, Professor of uh, Semitic Studies at the University of Sydney. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm in the languages area of the exotic languages of Arabic and Hebrew, Syriac, and Aramaic. Uh, my question is addressed to Dr. Christoph. Um, first of all, thank you very much indeed for a very enlightening, uh, very interesting presentation. I've learned a lot from it. I congratulate you on the marvelous work you and your 31 members of the Central Bureau of the HC with a small budget of six million. Four million. I wish it was six. Six million Australian dollars. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Aussie, Aussie dollars. Okay. Which really brings me very briefly to my question. 81 members, seven of whom, only seven, from the large continent of Africa. I did not hear much about membership from the broader region or area of the Middle East particularly <coughs> given the excellent benefits that might accrue, as you kindly illustrated to us, in international trade and commerce, the effect on human rights, and so on. Um, I wonder why this is. Is it because of lack of monetary contribution from the many countries, including my own country, Egypt, which I haven't heard that it was a member of, uh, of the CF. Uh, what about the Gulf countries? They can offer or donate money if, if it is a question of money. Uh, I would also urge, if I may, the establishment of a regional bureau of your wonderful uh, organization in the Middle East. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for these very thoughtful uh, comments and, and, and a very pertinent uh, question. Um, first of all, coming back to Egypt, uh, Egypt is in fact our longest standing African member. Uh, so Egypt is part of the seven African uh, members uh, we have. I must say that sadly there is a problem with arrears. Um, but um, we're working on that, and I, I, I hope we can uh, we can fix that. Um, 
the question of the, 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 the lack of membership in the, in the wider Middle East region, I think essentially has uh, to do or is a reflection of the lack of visibility in general we have in the, uh, in, uh, in the region, which again is probably mostly due, to, mostly due to the fact that we just lack the resources to go there on a regular basis. Um, and promote uh, our work. We, we have been there in, in different parts of uh, the Middle East, um, but not um, enough, uh, not regularly enough. Uh, and there is always the same problem that you know you start talking to some people, and then two years later they are out of office, they they, they change position, and then you basically have to start all over again. Um, so that is our, our challenge. I should tell you that the overall travel budget uh, for the organization, for all my colleagues and all of us, is about 70,000 uh, euro. So you paying flights and hotels and what have you. So you, you don't go that far or that uh, you know, uh, often to, to distant uh, places with that, uh, with that travel budget. That is our reality. And so it, it is really a, a, a challenge uh, to reach out to these uh, new states. Um, but we try to do what we can. I have had the privilege uh, of going to uh, some of the, uh, the Gulf uh, states, uh, with Oman, um, uh, amongst others. And um, there are two or three states of the Gulf Cooperation Council that are party to at least one uh, convention, particularly the LPSD convention that they prefer to. Um, Saudi Arabia is about to become uh, a member. I hope that will uh, you know, encourage other states in the region uh, to do so. Um, I'm personally also pleased about developments in, uh, in Iran, uh, where there is more and more interest for the work of the, of the Hague Conference. Um, I should say also that the Hague Conference is known for uh, not doing any um, political uh, work. We are purely uh, technical uh, organization. We are not interested in, 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 in politics. Um, uh, and we just believe that the reality of life as it is nowadays, be it personal relations, be it commercial relations, does call for um, a wider visibility and presence of the World of Day Conference uh, yeah, in all parts of, of, um, of the world. We are trying also to reach out to the Gulf Cooperation Council as an organization uh, to possibly enter into some sort of cooperation agreement uh, with them. Um, that is work in the, uh, in the process. Um, we also are actually in the process of entering into a whole series of different cooperation agreements with uh, leading academic uh, institutions uh, in, in different parts of the world. There the background is that uh, the more the organization grows and becomes a universal organization, um, for the, the, the small staff that we have, it's more and more challenging to follow all these developments in different parts of, uh, of the world. So we want to sort of outsource uh, that work and engage uh, universities 